Get ready for big oil earnings. Halliburton disappointing the street this morning, writing down its entire investment in Venezuela. And then we have big names coming up this week. Chevron, Exxon, Total, and Shell all at the end of the week. Also, the focus, rising oil prices not paying off for oil companies. This, to me, is the best chart in the commodity market. You have the yellow line is the oil price, and the white line is the S&P Energy Index. You have seen a big jump higher for the S&P equities. However, there's still a gap between that and the underlying oil oil price. Uh, joining us now is David Bonson, uh, the Bonson Group founder and CIO. And so with us from Minneapolis is Jim Paulson of Luthold Whedon. David, good to see you. Thanks for being here. Good to be here. How do you play energy stocks? Well, I uh, do favor these big integrated names just from a price standpoint right now. I think Exxon and Chevron give you balance sheet strength and significant dividend yield um, and then are more diversified in terms of their business lines. But really the most attractive spot is still in that midstream, and it's a story that has gotten very old for investors. People are very tired. Sentiment has been uh, out of favor a long time, but the MLPs, these pipelines, right now get more and more getting into a self-funding situation. They have a significant dividend yield, and supposedly a lot of their big drop and negative sentiment came with a commodity price being out of favor. Commodity prices have come back in favor, yet nothing's moved, even a highly supportive regulatory environment. So l let's go on MLPs for a second, because Part of the story is you want to own them because you need infrastructure, but that seems to be a primarily a Permian play here in the U.S. The other part of why you'd own them is their structure, but that's changing as a lot of their C-Corps are, are buying back their MLPs and their whole, like, let's spend a lot and return a lot in terms of dividends is changing as they want to live between cash flow. How do you square those two? Well, so I actually would argue that that structural change is one of the reasons to be buying. You have to be tax sensitive throughout, but the reality is, is that with the new tax law, there are... Um, I guess arguments you could make for some of these companies transitioning in their model to a different structure, but what that does is invites new investors in. Mm -hmm. And that's what they've largely lacked, is the ability to fund from equity. They have not had institutional supports. They've relied on a highly, shall we say, volatile and emotional retail investor. Fund flows dried up and it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think that what you're going to see with more C-Corps funding infrastructure is that you're still going to get great free cash flow and therefore great dividend yield but it will be all in the context of a, a more sustainable um, uh, business model. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when you talk about the um, issue regarding Permian, there is a lack of pipeline down there adequate for the production that they're doing. But that is not the only story of the MLPs. In fact, the liquefied natural gas story, particularly if you believe, as I do, that our ability to export that will prove to be one of the great growth stories of the next 10 years. We don't have the infrastructure in place. Companies like Enterprise Products out of uh, the Houston area, yeah. they're very well played uh, positioned for that. It represents a significant growth story in a company that already has has tons of distributable cash flow and is a, a very safe balance sheet. Jim, do you like energy stocks? I do, I do, Alex. He, he lays out a very good case fundamentally. Um, I'll just throw in uh, sort of a, some broader appeal to the, the entire group. You know, it's been very under owned. It's been beat up for so long. So if it does start to show positive momentum, there's a lot of portfolios that are going to have to at least reduce their underweights, which could add fuel to the upside. But I think the big thing is, is we've got an economy that's transitioning the world over from disinflation to inflation um, overall and rising yields. And if you think about the character of, the, of owning some energy stocks, they, are, are, uh, uh, they give you some yield, which uh, makes them a little like financials. If yields uh, go up, I, I think they, they tend to outperform. Uh, they do well if inflation fears continue to intensify. They typically have been an outperformer in, in that environment as well. And they're a great weak dollar play. The dollar's been weak, and if it breaks to lower lows, it's not only going to push crude oil prices higher, but it's also going to push portfolio managers into uh, sectors that do well with, with weak dollars. So I think there's a lot of attributes uh, favoring these stocks right now. And as you say, they, they still haven't caught up to recent moves in the product price yet and are, are making a, a play to catch up to what's already happened. 
And I think yeah. crude is going to even move higher here over the next year. Uh, David, I want to throw this at you because we just got news recently that the U.S. is considering rolling back uh, sanctions on Rusal, which has really been uh, pivotal to aluminum prices' huge rally if uh, Deripaska uh, winds up leaving the company. Do you play other commodities? Like, How do you factor in these kind of sanctions on and off in terms of your overall outlook? No, we, I don't. And in fact, we don't even really view our energy exposure as a commodity play, per se, other than that we're pointing out right now, as you did at the chart earlier, the disconnect between how the sector of stocks and operating companies has performed relative to the underlying commodity price. But the commodity beta is not very attractive to us on a risk-adjusted now I, a basis. I think there are times where it's probably very investable, but no, we like to buy operating entities that have free cash flow. Yeah, but the problem is, is that if you wind up having, uh, you can see oil dropping along with that news as well, as there were fears about sure. potential sanctions on uh, oil companies or even coal companies or nickel companies. Many argue that the geopolitical risk is very high in WTI and that's what led us the last couple uh, dollars higher. If that comes out, though, doesn't, how does that materially impact your thesis? Well, I mean, again, that, that, that type of movement is something we'd view very, very transitory, like the definition of transitory huh. movement. So on a more fundamental basis, longer term, we know what makes quantity prices move always and forever is supply and demand. And that's never going to change. And fundamentally, the demand story on oil and the supply story on oil was very misunderstood. We had a massive drop in oil in 2014. 14, 15, that was 100% supply related, not remotely demand driven. Right now, global demand is on fire and supplies got so low, they don't have the production capacity to even keep up. So you've seen it move higher. There's always going to be a geopolitical uh, orbit around oil prices, maybe less so with other commodities. So I think it's something we have to take into consideration. But what we're uh, trying to look underneath the hood to, no pun intended, hmm. is the operating entities and their growth of free cash flow. And uh, particularly like with the MLPs, but I, Exxon and Chevron as well. That's an incredibly consistent dividend yield in an environment where people are worried about income. Okay, Jim Paulson of Luthold Whedon. Thanks so much, Jim, for being with us today. David Bonson of the Bonson Group here in New York is going to be staying with us. And up next, we'll talk a little about retail and, for that matter, real estate and whether there may just be some overlooked opportunities in there, Alex. And